Welcome. Uh, this is another one of the talks we're giving. This one is the third in a series that I conceived of as sort of uh, connected one to another, salt, sugar, sex. Those who might have missed the first two, I figured we'd have the big, big crowd here for this one, probably the most interesting of the topics. But we're also going to take uh, a bit of a scientific approach, as you know. Uh, that is uh, part of the uh, idea of these talks is to sort of meld science with our experiences and also sort of explore different areas. I, I do have certain themes that I try and hit on. We're going to talk a bit about the birds and the bees because there's something to learn from them. One of my favorite comedians, if you've seen these different talks, comes up a lot is, is Woody Allen. And he's very famous when somebody once asked him, you know, is sex dirty? And he said, only when you do it right. And I think that kind of humor is very intimately tied to issues of sexuality because uh, sex is a very touchy subject. We're going to talk about things today. I, I don't think much that's going to make anybody uncomfortable. I mean, that's not my goal to make anybody uncomfortable. But it is going to be frank at some points about some things. Um, it's not going to be particularly graphic, although in some areas it will be. Y again, humor and sex, you know, there's a lot that goes on men versus women. Billy Crystal said, Women need a reason to have sex, men just need a place. So we definitely, I think, all know in our hearts that there's a difference, men versus women, and how they perceive issues related to sex. And of course, men can be often very self-deprecating. Here, uh, Steve Martin says, you know what, men, what that look women give when they want sex? Me neither. <laughs> all right, a little bit of that uh, sort of frustrated side of things. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this book. It's a very famous book. It's, it's been Currently, it's back in reprint, but it was out of print for a long time. And this is called The Rationale of the Dirty Joke. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's by a fellow named Gershon Legman, a very sort of odd fellow from actually from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who wrote, uh, sort of took the verbal history which of jokes, basically of dirty jokes, that really had not been uh, documented. And he published this book uh, in the 50s. It was, there was really nobody that would publish it. It was actually published by private money. But he was an academic, and he approached sexual humor from uh, a psychological perspective. And in this book, for those who are interested, if you can find a copy, is literally every dirty joke ever told. So for interest, if you're interested in reading every dirty joke ever told, you can find it in this book. Um, you will also find a, uh, a psychological analysis of why that joke is funny, which makes it somewhat interesting, I think. And of course, I don't think we can talk about sexuality in the modern era without thinking of this fellow, Sigmund Freud. He coined the term psychosexual development, um, which encompasses the connection between sex drive um, and our psychological tendencies. And then he also talked a lot about how humor was sort of a, a release valve for those tensions that come from uh, issues of sex. The word taboo. Uh, is, is a, a sociologic and anthropo anthropologic term. You know, sexuality and talking about sex is, can be very uncomfortable uh, because of the private nature of it and also the social stigma attached to it. So, you know, sex occurs a lot here in the mind. The question is, with this picture, uh, whose brain is this, a woman's or a man's brain? Does anybody know? Well, the idea is it's a man's brain because he's always got sex on the mind. There is, if you look for the male brain, and you may have seen this, this is a humorous analysis of the male brain. And notice how sex takes up a very large component of that brain. I think there's some funny areas if you've never seen this. Attention span, very small, listening particle. <laughs> Toilet aiming cell. I think some people can get a kick out of this. Now, the female brain is likewise um, graphically analyzed. The need for commitment hemisphere, quite large. Um, shopping. <laughs> now, here, they're, they're making fun again of the sex issue here. Note how closely connected the small sex cell is to the listening gland. It's funny stuff, but there's a lot of humor in sex, and we got to find it there, too, because it is otherwise a touchy and not boring subject, but it can be a little uncomfortable. Now. Of course, the question is why? Why do we care about sex? Why is it so important to us? Uh, you know, why does it uh, take up a lot of our mental time? It does. Uh, issues related to it or related to talking about it or worrying about it. And this man, I want to see if anybody here knows who this fellow is. It's a tough, a tough question. Anybody want to venture a guess? This cloaked fellow? Okay, so Darwin. 
And the reason I'm talking about um, uh, Charles Darwin when we're talking about sex is that sex, when I, when I mentioned the talk, which was about fulfillment and destiny, sex is a big part of our lives because it's a biological need and drive. It's fundamentally uh, not just necessary, it's part of our biology. Um, and how is that the case? And we'll, we'll talk about it a bit. I do want to talk a little bit about um, evolution, okay? Just briefly. So we all know this idea of evolution is the survival of the fittest, which is that there's a competition, and those who are strongest or most capable of, of uh, surviving in the wilderness then get to uh, spawn children and reproduce. And that is a, a big part of um, Darwin's theories. And the way he described that survival of the fittest, he has, there are two components to it. There's natural selection. Okay, and natural selection, here's an example of it. Um, these are two birds, if you will, and he talked about the beaks of birds and how they would change over time to become more ideally suited for purposes of finding food. And so here in the first generation, you see two different uh, birds, or birds of the same species, but with two different beaks, one born with this more small snout, the other one with a larger beak. And then in the second generation, because in theory, his argument is, well, it's easier for this bird to gain access to food that maybe this one can't with the small beak. You see more of the large beak birds, uh, proportionally less of the small beak birds in the third generation, and thus the trait is selected. And this is called natural selection, okay? This is competition based on uh, increased uh, survival based on their ability to forage for food or be successful. Uh, more generally with their ability to survive. And these characteristics, these different characteristics, of course Darwin didn't know this, but are carried on chromosomes and genes, okay? The genes that are on these chromosomes. This is an example of a, of a human chromosome, of course blown up very large, and the genes are on this long strand of DNA as we're all taught. In the human, there are uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? You get one set from your parent, from each parent, one set from your mother, and one set from your father. And of course, the thing that distinguishes um, men and women is, is pretty remarkably small when you think about, you know, how small genes are. Uh, this is a woman, because it has two X chromosomes, but here's a larger blown up electron micrograph, microscopic version of the X chromosome and then this is a Y chromosome. But I'm gonna talk about two things that go back to basic biology class, and these are groaners. I, I said no groaning, please, okay? These are terms that you may remember, you may not remember from the good old biology days. And we talk about something called mitosis and meiosis, okay? And this, I think, caused every kid a lot of difficulty in class because it was like you couldn't remember what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis, they sound so similar. Why do they even make them sound similar? Just because it makes it so difficult to remember beyond just the difficulty of understanding this. But these are two distinctly different ways that cells reproduce to pass their genetics and their traits on, okay? So in mitosis, you see uh, it, there's a, a doubling of the DNA. In other words, there's a copy that's made and then they center up in the center, and then they divide off. Here in mitosis, we're making identical, identical cells, the same. Whereas in meiosis, the division allows for a separation of the genes into um, uh, a reduced number, uh, so that these are then sex cells, or gametes as we call them. Now, we're gonna look at mitosis again, okay? This is duplication, okay? So when we talk about sex that goes on in the animal world or in our world, we're not in this area, okay? We're not, in, we're not duplicating, we're doing something different, okay? But in mitosis, you have doubling of the DNA, separation, and when you're done with this process, and it's very complex, very intriguing, you end up with two identical cells is what you started with. So you start with one, you get two copies. It's like a Xerox machine. Now, the reason this is important because there is a form of reproduction that we use uh, mitosis in, and that's called cloning, okay? So cloning is this 
process of mitosis. And here we show how the sheep do it, and I'm not familiar with all the nitty gritty of this, but you start with a, I guess, the DNA from one cell of this sheep, and then you put it into a udder cell, I guess that's what they use. They culture it, implant it in the surrogate, and then out comes this sheep. Now, I must say I said this sheep, but this is the sheep where the genetics came from. Okay, so this is through mitosis. In other words, we get a, it's like a copy machine. That's what cloning is. And I guess we already know that. Okay, cloning, very popular concept. You know, what's going to happen? Are we one day going to clone people? And to be honest with you, they're cloning animals right now. And there's a lot of failed attempts when they do this. But there will come a day that the potential will be there for human cloning, no doubt about it. And the question is going to be, well, why don't we? Well, let's, you know, let's do it. Uh, you know, the cutest baby, let's clone them and make a million of them. He's so cute, my baby, of course, not your baby. Make a million of them because they're so perfect and great. But there's a problem with this, and that is that the clones are copies. And these copies are not going to be as capable um, of competing in the world, if you will, where they're uh, competing against one another. If there's a change or some other adaptation they need, they're all going to be very similar. The differences would be very beneficial for the natural selection process. Now here, I'm sort of ana making an analogy of dealing the cards, okay? When you're doing mitosis, everybody's getting the same hand. But in this process of meiosis, sounds the same, different, we're mixing them up. So here is meiosis, okay? Now I said this is gonna be science, so let's not, get, not go to sleep quite yet. It'll get more interesting. In this situation, we double the DNA, the cells divide, and at the end of it, we have half the number of chromosomes in each one. Notice, here we started with a red and a blue chromosome. And here we have two separate red chromosomes, two separate blue chromosomes. We've uh, divided these. They will need to come together during a uh, sexual connection so that they then have the full complement of genes. Okay, So we're rearranging the genes. So this is what happened. There is meiosis, the process, produces the sperm and the egg. Okay, and these are early uh, pictorials of uh, what a sperm would look like under a microscope in the early days. Okay, and to understand how different the world is than it used to be, this was the conceptualization of what was going on in a sperm. It was called a homunculus. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that term. Sort of a miniature person, how they conceived of it. They had no idea how to explain it. But they sort of, if you can see, there's a little, essentially a little baby in here that is essentially the source. And of course, it was a very male-dominated sort of conception. You know, the, the, the man is providing the image that is about to be uh, produced and so forth. Whereas, of course, we know that there's a lot more going on here in the, in the sperm. There's uh, DNA material that's up here. There's this tail that you know is wiggling with all sorts of mitochondria or the power plant, if you will, where the energy is produced because these are very strongly energy producing cells. And believe it or not, as crazy as it is, and of course we all know this, this is an old picture of me and of everybody here. I mean, it's weird, but this is true. I mean, we were all single cells at one time. So the sperm, the, the smallest cell in the human body, the egg, the largest cell in the human body. I mean, already you see that enormous dichotomy, male, female, the largest cell, the smallest cell coming together. And this is just a picture of the sperm bound to egg. These are uh, electron micrographs. And of course, the sperm penetrates into the egg to you know, insert the DNA so that it's you know, the two halves of the genetic material meet and then you have a full complement for development. We're gonna talk about birds and bees, really talk about birds and bees because they exemplify sex in the world that we live in. And we talked before about the natural selection. There, were, there are two forms of uh, selection going on in the world, Darwin told us. One is also called sexual selection, okay? So natural selection would select for characteristics that make a uh, organism better capable to live in its environment and to survive and thrive. Sexual selection doesn't do that, and this is a peacock's feathers, and of course, does anybody know whether this is a male or a female? Male. All the birds that are very dramatic looking are males, because they're trying to you know, get the female interested. All right, and it's sort of curious, I mean, because when you think about it, I mean, although there's, in human sexuality, there's male and female trying to sort of woo each other, I think we'd say that uh, oftentimes, as we conceive of it, the woman is trying to become more you know, fashion conscious and so forth for appearance to attract the male. But this plumage 
cannot be helpful for this bird running away from a predator or trying to uh, get something to eat. I mean, it's getting in the way of things. And of course, these characteristics are selected by the fact that a, a mandrel or these various birds or this lizard or whatever have a greater ability to uh, find a mate if they have these characteristics. Now why that is, it doesn't really go with, I mean this is illogical. I mean there's a lot of logic to natural selection. It's like, oh I see, the beak makes it easier to catch this, get the worm and those, that's why the long beak bird you know, grows and flourishes and the short beak bird dies. But the sexual selection, these factors, they don't factor into that kind of logic. There's sort of an illogic. And in fact, the illogic extends as far as this. This is a, some sort of ancient antelope. Notice the horns. I mean, they were ridiculously large. I mean, so much so that you'd think, how could this beast even survive? It doesn't make any sense. And yet, sexual selection would allow for this to develop. I was reminded of the Cole Porter song. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. When I always heard that song, I wasn't familiar with it, like, as in the, all the verses. But I always thought, do it, do it. I don't know, I was a kid, a young man, I thought, do it. No, fall in love. That's the it. Okay, they're not doing it. But they do do it. Okay, they, animals are doing it, flowers are doing it, everybody's doing it. So the bee, you know, we talk about the birds and the bees. We talked about the birds, how they ex exemplify one act, uh, aspect of sexuality, which is that sexual selection and the males having their appearance change to woo the female. And then we talk about the bee. Now the bee is a very unique, um, is very unique from its own genetics. Bees are not having sex, and that may not matter to you. You may not have thought of that. But bees are not having sex. Of course, the queen bee is having sex. The queen bee has sex with a drone. As a result of the fact that the drone has a half as many genes as a queen bee does, what happens is when the drone's genetics are married to half of the queens, all the female workers share 100% of their father's DNA. Now, you and I share half of the genetics of our fathers and half of our mothers. So the, the sisters share all of their father's DNA, right here, all the sisters in the hive, they share half of their mothers. So we call bees super sisters. So they're more closely related as sisters than you would be to your sister. This is among the reasons why a bee will bite, will sting you, because they're so closely related to their brethren, or to their sisters, I should say, it's the wrong word, that they will actually attack you to save the other, their other sisters because their genetics are so close. It's like almost like saving your identical twin. It's not quite. It's three quarters. Your identical twin would be 100% of the same genetics. All right. So bees are not the point of birds and the bees. Pollination is the point of birds and the bees. So this is also sex. And uh, for those of you who have been to some of the other talks, I love the TED Talks. If you haven't seen them, there are so many fascinating 20 and 30 minute talks about a variety of topics, I recommend it to you, www.ted.com. Steal, just for a minute, a brief video of Jonathan Drury talking about pollen. Okay, this is pollen, and it's very unique looking, okay? And these are, uh, what you can see here, this is what's called the pollen tube, okay? So the pollen lands on the flower stamen, or stigma, and it pre creates a pollen tube. So I wanna show you how truly sexual the process is within flowers. Now I want to show you just another example of some rampant sex. This is a fellow, Lou Schwarzenberg, who spent his career uh, doing slow motion and high definition video of pollination. Now the point is to, obviously it's, this is going to be a beautiful video, and you're going to see some, we're going to see some sex. I just wanted to share with you, I thought this, this fellow did such a great job with his video, it's so beautiful. The pollen grains, that's sex right there. The pollination happening. I urge you to go look on TED and see if you can find that video. It's very enjoyable. All right, so here again, was, this is sort of a display of what's going on here. You can see in the flower, the pollen grain has a sperm cell, which then will go down here to the ovary of a flower. I mean, so they're having sex. Not much different than humans, so to speak as far as the ultimate processes that are going on. Now, with this notion where we're talking about reproduction and the genetics, and we talked about how sexuality is determined here at the genetic level, at the chromosome level, but there's more to sex than just the genetics. And this fellow, John Money, 
I don't know if anybody knows of him. He was a professor of mine at Hopkins, and he was a famous sex researcher, a sexologist, fascinating fellow. He coined the term gender identity, and he thought that hormones played a larger role um, in development of sexuality than did necessarily the genetics, okay? Rather than the X and the Y being the determinant, the hormones that were produced were what was the determinant. And he became involved in a very famous uh, study. You all may have heard of it, or you may have read the book. And this is about the Rymar twins. Now, these two boys were born to this woman in, I don't know if it was in the 50s. Um, they were identical twins. And unfortunately, this was up in Alberta, Canada. Unfortunately, the child was circumcised by a visiting doctor. One of them was injured severely, and their penis was essentially uh, destroyed by the circumcision process. They used an electrical kind of circumcision device. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if they do this anymore, but whatever. It, the, the child had no penis, okay? So you now have twins in which one has a penis and one does not have a penis. These are less than a year old. And they didn't know what to do with this child. How was this child going to be raised and so forth? And, um, of course, they're living in rural Canada, not aware of what to do. They approached Dr. John Money, who was the head of sex, sexual identity and sexual reassignment at Johns Hopkins, essentially the pioneer of sexual, you know, sex change surgery. And he told them, you should raise this child as a girl. And so what they did was they raised the child as a, as a girl, and, um, but through, through using hormone, you know, providing female hormones at the time of puberty. Um, and the child developed secondary sexual characteristics and looked all the world like a girl. Um, of course, they never told the child, well, I shouldn't say of course, they did not tell the child the story. They didn't think the child could understand or fathom or deal with this issue. And uh, the children were born as uh, for essentially fraternal twins. And uh, John Money, I, I hate to say this, but he went around saying that this was a perfect success story and showed the plasticity of sex. That is, through hormone manipulation, you can literally take an identical twin and change its sexual orientation. Well, the truth of the matter was that didn't happen. Uh, the child actually grew up, found out what happened, realized it had had a great deal of difficulty during its growth stages of, you know, through his teenage years. Ultimately was reassigned to a man and then ultimately committed suicide. It's a very tragic story, tragic on a lot of levels. I mean, tragic for the people, tragic because it was for many years um, held up as an example of how sexuality is very plastic and can be manipulated through hormones, irregardless of genetics or the biology, if you will, that part of the biology, and it's absolutely not true. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't comment specifically on sexual reassignment in other situations, but in this type of situation, clearly not effective. I wanted to talk about hormones, and when I, Google every so often, you know, I'll Google a topic and say, what picture comes up when I type in hormones <laughs> under the image section? This crazy picture, I don't know what that means. Hormones on his knuckles, I don't know, a tattoo, it's bizarre. Now, hormones are, I mean, they're, they're important in many, many ways in the body. And one of the things that, that you may not realize is that cholesterol is the backbone for all hormone production. Of course, this answers the, the eternal question, which you may or may not have thought of, which is, if cholesterol is so bad for me, how come I make so much of this? <laughs> Which I think is an obvious question to ask. And then you find out, oh, it's important for making hormones, and it's important for other actions and the cell lining and so forth. But this is one of its most important features. The difference between the hormones, male and female, very meager. I mean, you guys aren't chemists, so you might look at all three of these. I would still, you know, I'm, I've been taught the difference between these. But they look pretty similar, testosterone, estrogen, they look about the same. They chemically have massively distinctive qualities though. Now cholesterol goes through a series of changes chemically in the body to produce other hormones as well. It produces aldosterone, which is a hormone that controls blood pressure, cortisone, cort prednisone or cortisone, and sex, other sex hormones, estradiol, which is estrogen, testosterone. And interestingly, and the adrenal gland is not responsible for all the production of these hormones, but it's, it's responsible for all the production of the cortisone hormone in our body, okay? Uh, the aldosterone, which is a blood pressure rising uh, hormone, and then some sexual hormone, okay? Now, hormones vary. We know this. Men, women, it's very different. There's a complex variation in hormones in women that go on during the menstrual cycle. This is one of the major distinctions, men to women. Their hormone changes. When the hormones increase, 
the lining of the uterus changes, ovary grows and uh, matures uh, an egg, and then the egg is released. This is all brought together in one page here where we see the uterine lining, the ovary, the different hormone variations. Women have, as we know, cycles. They also have another cycle, and that's called the menopause. All right, so women's hormones, as it affects, this, this, we're going to talk about how this affects sexuality, during the puberty phase, a long phase of high levels of estrogen, and then diminution or resolution here in menopause. This is distinctly different than men. And there's a bit of a misunderstanding out there. You know, okay, so that's the women's thing. How do the guys work? And you'll hear, you know, there's male, you know, I definitely read this. If you go on the internet, you're like, there's male menopause. There is no male menopause, okay? That exact pattern of hormonal change does not happen in men. So when people say the male menopause, it's not true. That said, there are changes in male testosterone production, okay? So the male hormone, this is people who are, have underactive testosterone levels as they get over, older. Very few have underactive testosterone levels, but when we get into our 60s, 70s, and 80s, there is a much larger percentage of people who have low levels of testosterone. Now, this is not a male menopause, because a male menopause would be, you know, at 50, women's estrogen levels are, are it would be 100% of the women. They'd all be up here. Okay, that would be the difference. The women would be all up here. They don't have any estrogen. 100% are hypogonadal gonadal, or low in their sexual hormone. Whereas men have a small percentage in their 60s, and it increases over time. This, though, does not necessarily translate into a menopausal phase. So even though you might say, well, hold on here. This is scary to me. Maybe guys in the audience like, hold on. I fit into this group. I got a 60% chance of having a low testosterone. True, true. Or actually 40% low testosterone for, you, for uh, a 60% low free testosterone. But that will not necessarily translate into any effect, believe it or not, they've studied this, on sexual function, performance, interest, even though it's low. Now it may or it may not, okay? But it's not definitively connected. Whereas you might say, well look, it must be the case that 60 or 80% of men aren't having any sexual interest or anything like that. It's not true. It's not true. There's not a, a direct connection. Male hormone manipulation uh, can be done, but it doesn't accomplish much for sexuality unless a person is extremely low. Or in a person who is slightly low, we sometimes try supplementing it to see if it provides an increase in sexual interest. It is important for sexual function, but it's not, um, it's not the pill, if you will, to enhance sexual function in men. And we all know what that pill is. And that pill was discovered by something I call serendipity. And we're going to get to that pill in a second. Making a desirable discovery by accident. This is very common in the world we live in, very common in medicine. Okay, here's a list of some innovations and their serendipitous sources. All right, the tire, I guess this guy was a veterinarian. I, I haven't researched all these. The ballpoint pen, a sculptor. Photocopying, okay, give the lawyers credit. Post-it notes, we've all heard that one maybe from the 3M deal. Velcro was seen in, you know, the little burrs that stick to people's legs in the fields. That's how he discovered uh, this Frenchman, a uh, French researcher. Scotchgard was accidental. Um, NutraSuite was accidental. Saccharin was accidental. I mean, they touched it and they're like, oh, that's sweet. What was that? And then penicillin, of course, very famous. And I know you may not have seen this, this photo before, this picture, but this is the serendipitous discovery of Viagra. Somehow this elephant found it. No, I'm just kidding. It's, I can't, I don't speak this language, but I think I get the point of the cartoon. <laughs> Does anybody translate that one? Where's my box of Viagra? <laughs> where's my box? That's OK. Where's my box? Thank you. OK, very good. All right. So what we're talking about here, though, is uh, sildenafil or Viagra. And uh, discovered, now I want to tell you a little bit about the story. You probably know this. But this story, uh, the medicine was a research compound uh, that was discovered by Pfizer and by some researchers in England. And they knew that this medicine had an effect to relax smooth muscle. Now, just to understand the chemistry of Viagra, this is just a small portion of the biological processes that are going on, how Viagra works. It basically helps relax smooth muscle. They thought it would relax the smooth muscle or the muscle lining vessels. Um, and they thought that it would be very helpful for blood pressure, preventing uh, heart, heart attacks and strokes, or for angina. 
What they found was it did not do that, okay? But they did find that the guys who were in the study kept coming back for more pills when they stopped the study. <laughs> this is absolutely true how this happened. And of course, smart enough to ask, well, why do you want to continue to participate? They found out that there were a fair number of guys who were getting uh, improved erections with this medicine. And the, the method by which it works is it relaxes a smooth muscle and allows better uh, blood flow into the penis and allow, allows for a better erection. The medicine is not perfect, of course, it's not a perfect medicine, but it does enhance the chemistry, the chemistry of erection. And believe it or not, not only for this do you get, you know, uh, to sell $2 billion worth of Viagra every year, but you also, the guys who are behind it, or something that's won the Nobel Prize, I didn't put that up here. Now, the interesting thing, I do wanna sort of ex explore a myth that Viagra has an effect on women, and it really doesn't. It does enhance blood flow, in the sexual organs of women, it does not provide a sexual, fundamental sexual effect that's positive for women. That's what the research shows. So men and women, very different, very different on this front. Uh, another aspect of sexuality, and I'm gonna bring up another mystery man. I don't know if anybody recognizes this guy. Oh, I gave it away, here. <laughs> Cheating. I didn't know it was on there, I didn't see it. All right, did anybody recognize him though when he's thrown up there? Kinsey, yeah, the Kinsey Report a very famous, I mean, very famous researcher. He started out, actually, we talked about bees at the beginning. He researched wasps and their sexual activity and then decided, hey, humans were more interesting. He was at the University of Indiana. His uh, research was funded by the Rockefeller Institute. I mean, this was real science at the time. Of course, he was breaking ground because these topics were very much not studied by, uh, rigorously by scientists. And he published his first book in 1948, just to give you a timeline, Sexual Behavior in Human Male. And basically he did, all, primarily his researching was done through questionnaire and interview. Uh, there was some observational studies which got him in a lot of trouble at points, to be honest with you. But that was less of the point of his research than the interview style. He was apparently a, a curious fellow, too. I mean, you know, there's no question he's a little bit different. In 53, he published the female side of the uh, information. Apparently, Mae West had heard of Kinsey, of course. She was alive at the time. She said the word sex was rarely uttered in her day. But he, she said of Kinsey, that guy merely makes it easy for me. Now I don't have to draw many blueprints. We were both in the same business, except for I saw it first. Funny. Now, I'm gonna give you a little bit of list, and this is just to give you an example of the ongoing research that's going on at Kinsey Institute. Okay, and this is a little bit graphic, I will say. It's about as graphic as we're gonna get. A table which talks about different forms of sexual activity among different age groups. And this is the kind of information that Kinsey was able to share with people that basically showed that sexuality goes on through the ages. So, you know, it has, some very, it has a lot of variations. There's a lot more exploration and variety than people may have identified because people didn't talk about it. So he was very instrumental in uh, bringing these topics out to public view and to make them more acceptable. But look, sexuality has been topic for humans through the ages. 32,000 years ago, this is a um, sculpture found in the caves in Chavot, France. Now, this mystery man took it a little bit further. I think you guys may know who he is. Anybody want to venture? Hugh, yeah, Hugh Hefner. Okay, so he came up with Playboy, of course, 1953, same year as Kinsey, uh, publishing his texts on women's sexuality. So there was a lot in the air, there was a lot that was basically becoming publicized at that time. And that leads me to, to talk, if you will, that was the latest in 1953, that was cutting edge. And I do wanna talk a little bit about this topic of internet pornography. And I don't have an answer for pornography or whether it's good or bad, that's not gonna be my comment. It's certainly part of human, the human condition and humanity. It's been around forever, or at least on some level or another the interest in sexual objects and sexual imagery. Witness the 32,000 year old sculpture. And to give you an idea though of how rampant pornography is, pornography is over a hundred, now this is all pornography, we're not talking about the internet, all pornography is over a hundred billion dollar a year industry worldwide, which makes it equivalent to Apple as far as its total sales. Just to give you a notion of how much that's a part of human sexuality. Statistics for the internet, 12% of websites are pornographic, 25% of searches are for sexually related topics. And 70% of internet pornography traffic occurs between nine and five o'clock, nine in the morning and 5 p.m. So this is very common, it's, it's sort of weird, weird facts. These are apparently real facts. 
Now, there, there is a study that was published, and this is actually a very interesting book uh, by two researchers from Boston University. It's called A Billion Wicked Thoughts. And basically what they did, they are using the latest research techniques to analyze the sexual search topics that they find on like Google or actually they used Alexis, a different search engine, to analyze what men and women are interested in, to try and understand what men and women find sexually interesting. And their summary thoughts. These aren't news, but they're, they're um, another way of getting at the information. Men are aroused visually, whereas women prefer to have their emotions, Im imagination stimulated. In fact, these researchers connect men and their interest in visual pornography and women's interest, which is, has a similar tendency, I don't want to say it's the same, with the romance novel, that it's doing the same sort of thing sexually in the brain that men are programmed for and women are. And we can argue this point, but this is their, this is their claim. And, and to be honest with you, uh, romance websites are extremely popular among women as opposed to pornography websites, much more popular among men. Men have a more direct mind-body connection when it comes to arousal, and women have a much more complex connection that has a much greater connection with emotions. And I think this is part of the distinction that men and women feel in their sexual interests as far as communication. And often the women display don't care for pornography because although it, it has a physical effect on them, it doesn't have an emotional or, or psychological effect. So in summary, W.C. Field said it well, I think. Some things are better than sex, some things are worse, but there's nothing like it. All right, and I think that's why we all decided to come here and talk about this topic and hear about it. And that's my talk for today, and I'd like to hear from you if you have any questions. Thanks very much.